Hello, I'm Lydia Talbot. On behalf of the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries, welcome to this special edition of Sanctuary on Presidential Politics and Keeping Faith. Now here is the chair of our board, the Reverend Dr. Myron McCoy, Senior Pastor of the Historic Chicago Temple First United Methodist Church. I, I guess I'm uh, like the others, a lot of fear, a lot of shock. Uh, certainly concerns in the community uh, regarding immigrants, regarding uh, LGBTQ community, uh, 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 even folk who, who, who had an interest in the environment. Where, where are we going? Uh, what's going to happen with our standing in the world? Uh, how will we relate to other people? It's not a time to fold up their tents but it is a time to remain vigilant and working and advocating for those things that we believe in and we think are right and uh, uh, being advocates for uh, people who feel most fearful. Now we invite you to step inside a timely and provocative interfaith gathering called In Good Faith, Divided We Fall, Are Justice, Healing and Reconciliation Possible in Trump's America? featuring Christians, Muslims, and Jews at the Bernadine Center of Catholic Theological Union. Stay with us for some ideas about looking inward at what your own faith community can do better to confront injustice that will challenge what you think about your politics and your faith today on Sanctuary. Welcome to everybody who's here with us and to the audiences watching at home to this In Good Faith gathering. In Good Faith is an initiative of the Bernadine Center here at the Catholic Theological Union that focuses on a trilateral dialogue between Jews, Muslims, and Christians on issues that matter to our collective faiths. Our distinguished panel, starting from my far left, with Carmen Nanco Fernandez, who is currently professor of Hispanic theology and ministry at Catholic Theological Union. And seated next to her, to my immediate left, is Brian Massingale, a Roman Catholic priest of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee and currently professor of theological and social ethics at Fordham University, Michael Zedek, Rabbi Emeritus of both Emmanuel Congregation here in Chicago, Illinois, and the Congregation of Benai Yehuda in Kansas City, Missouri. And to my immediate right is Linda Sarsour, who is an award-winning Brooklyn-born Palestinian-American Muslim racial justice and civil rights activist. Welcome all to the panel. We just had a contentious election that was preceded with a contentious campaign trail in which some of the worst of the political and media rhetoric on some of our faith communities and other race and ethnic communities was out in the open, emboldened and strengthened and reverberating on a daily basis. What challenges do you feel that exist within your own faith community that have kept this faith community from, from reaching a certain point of reconciliation, of, of, of being at the forefront of justice. Where are the shortcomings in our communities? Does justice, reconciliation, healing, are these possible? And I must say that my very um, Bronx self responds, no. And in that sense, one says, well, you're a Roman Catholic, you're a Christian. How do you respond no to the call to be reconciling and just and healing? And then I say, well, how do we address the fact 
that our, and I'm speaking as Roman Catholic, in our community, we did not deal effectively with the rhetoric of disenfranchisement when it was happening in real time. And now we sit, <clears throat> the sad part is we know it's like 77 days later, and now we sit and we say, what did we do wrong? But the issue is that it's, it's not that this was the first time that we had to deal with this rhetoric. This rhetoric has been around. We just pushed it under the carpet of assimilation, and now the bumps are there, and we tripped. Brian? Uh, let me begin by telling a story of visiting the Bishops' Conference. I'm going right there right away. Going to visit, visiting the U.S. Conference of Bishops in the aftermath of the 2008 election. This was the election of Barack Obama's first, first election, and there was this great kind of sense of euphoria in the country. We had turned a corner. This was an international event. It was seismic in its scope, and yet I attended a meeting and like three days later at the conference and headquarters in Washington, D.C., and it was as if I was entering a morgue. It was as inter I was entering a wake that people, the bishops there, many of them were beside themselves, wondering how could this have happened? Didn't our people get the memo? And that, and that speaks to an enduring tension in the Catholic community between a faction of Catholics who believe that issues of social concern can be encapsulated around abortion and same-sex marriage basically under the umbrella of religious liberty, and other issues that are issues of prudential judgment only. Except there are whole groups of Catholics, especially those who are impacted by the realities of immigration or Black Lives Matter or issues of, of poverty, for whom those are not the most pressing issues, or at least not the only issues for political discernment. And that tension has been one that has bedeviled the Catholic community and keeps us from being forthrightly engaged in the challenges that have come in the wake of the election. So Michael, if you were to um, examine the conscience of our faith communities to try to ascertain how we contributed to getting to this point of this breakdown in consensus, um, especially moral consensus, whether through action or inaction, what would be your findings? Well, fortunately, uh, just all a Catholic problem, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can move on to your next question. No, yeah. mu mu much more substantively. Uh, one, uh, there was a dear colleague uh, who used to say when we were talking about the, the, the splits within the Jewish community, uh, I don't care what branch of Judaism you belong to as long as you're ashamed of it. Mm. And, 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 and I think there's profound insight in, in that because we are all too readily to endlessly forgive every inconsistency and peculiarity in our own tradition and we'll never find room for that in somebody else's. Uh, uh, the insider versus outsider, the object versus subject, all of which is not limited to my tradition, but since I happen to be made up of human beings, we happen to have a, a surplus of that capacity as well. Uh, so those are first concerns in any conversation of this type to me. The Deuteronomy statement, you know the heart of the stranger. As it happens, uh, variations on that phrase occur 36 times in the Torah. That's a provocative number in Jewish tradition. It's double high, A, double life. Second, why the saying of it over and over again? And the answer has got to be because it's not natural for us. Otherwise, why would the text need to bother to say it? Remember the heart of the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. If we take it apart, unpack it a little bit, uh, for the ancients, as some here know, the heart didn't mean I didn't feel like being nice to you. It meant I had no intellectual discourse that mattered to me with you, because the heart, the head, the heart was the seat of intelligence. But if you know the person's heart, then you may not know their name, but they cannot be a stranger. And that's where we've got to start moving with rapidity or we're going to run out of time. Linda, you've been at the uh, forefront of pushing the envelope within the Muslim community. Um, where has the Muslim community, similar to the Jewish and the Catholic and the Christian in general, 
gone wrong in not foreseeing where we could be, at, you know, in terms of here and now, and what kind of issues do you think we need to grapple with? I'm, first and foremost, I want to say I'm very honored and humbled to be on the stage with these very distinguished faith leaders. Um, I think that within the Muslim community, I don't actually see any contradiction to doing social justice work within the framework of Islam, but I do see tr contradictions of doing it in the community that I come from and some element of the community that I come from. There's some phenomenon about Muslim issues. I don't know what a Muslim issue is. I mean, Muslims care about health care. We are women. We care about reproductive rights. We are uh, Many of us are immigrants or children of immigrants. We care about immigration. We are also one of the most diverse faith groups with about a third of our communities African-American, so we should care, and our religion tells us to care about racial justice. So what I think the, the struggle has been is this idea that we work on Muslim issues and. Uh, one of the things that I've been pushing um, or doing in the Muslim community and almost kind of went on my own way and it was kind of like, if you can't beat me, join me. Um, and I think I'm at the you can't beat me moment right now. Um, that we have also an intergenerational kind of gap within the Muslim community as well. And I think that this kind of up and coming generation for us worship is what is your what is our religion doing on the streets of our communities? What is our religion doing to show up for the most vulnerable of communities? Stop telling people that Islam is a religion of peace and start showing people what Islam is. And I think that our generation is a, t a gen generation of practicality. I want you to feel me, to remember me, and not just sit and have a, a dialogue with me and walk away. I want you to say, uh, I didn't remember a darn thing that girl said up there or that woman said up there but I know how she made me feel, and I also get to experience her in social justice work. So I think within the Muslim community, it's this, it's this moving from just saying we're gonna work on Muslim issues and not really being able to define what those are. Uh, another piece of it is also um, similarly on some of these conservative issues. Can you be a Muslim that has very uh, core you know, beliefs about certain things and kind of holding those inside, but still showing up in a space where there might be people who may not agree with you on other things? And I think that young Muslims in particular have been able to challenge that and have been able to show up in spaces uh, to stand with the most marginalized, regardless of whether we agree with everybody in the room on everything. Well, how do some of you deal with the challenges that you mentioned within your own community? How do you push back and try to change things? Carmen? Actually, I was going to respond to, to what Linda said, because on the Christian side of the house, the problem is that sometimes we don't accept that these are Christian issues. Racism is a Christian issue. And it's a Catholic issue. And, and Islamophobia is a real Christian issue. It's a big problem. And uh, anti-Semitism, we still have yet to, to, to deal the way we need to. I mean, it, it takes John Paul II to stand at the Western Wall with, with a prayer of contrition before we're allowed in some places to even address that, 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 you know, that Judaism is, is a legitimate concern that Catholic school teachers need to learn. So the flip side of it is that some of our communities were able to say, oh, no, that's social justice. I don't have to deal with it. Or that's the social justice Catholics, not my side of the Catholic house. So for Christians, I think we have to own up and say, these are our issues, and we need to get on it. Did you want to add something, Brian? Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, well, but, but to give a concrete example of that, even when the, the Catholic Church in the United States addresses racism, for example, the um, the last time the Catholic bishops of the United States addressed the sin of racism was in 1979 in a collective statement. Now think about that, 1979, it's been a little bit, um, a long time now. But the title of the document was Brothers and Sisters to Us. And as I point out, who's the us? And it comes down to how does a Catholic church understand who it is, who we are? Who's included in the we? And I think that that's a question that we're grappling with in the United States. It's a question that each of our faith traditions are grappling with, but it comes down to who is included in the we? Who are we called to be brother and sister to? Brothers and sisters to us. It betrays the fact that the Catholic Church in the United States defines itself as being basically a white middle-class suburban reality. And therefore, it has to find some way of welcoming these others who don't fit that definition or who are Catholics by exception or Catholics by default. Their Catholicism is kind of deficient. And that shows itself then in how we enter into these public policy debates as well then. 
Well, the answer is, of course, sometimes. Well, I mean, or, or, or which ones? Yeah. When? Yeah. Yes. Uh, because, and, and the reason why I think I know that answer is because that's not just true about Catholics, mm -hmm. after all. Uh, it, a, a personal frame. Um, I've been a rabbi, or as I like to joke, in the sin business since 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's never a slow season. But, <laughs> right. uh, but uh, maybe three years into my life as a rabbi, I was thinking about leaving. I'm like, what kind of crazy job is this? The congregation is never going to do all I want them to do. I'm never going to be all I'm supposed to be. I, I was thinking of leaving. An older colleague said to me, uh, extraordinary impact on me, he said, Michael, what makes you, think you th makes you think you should be a better failure than Moses? Mm. <laughs> and it, but there was comfort in there, mm. even as Mother Teresa put it in another way, I wasn't called to be successful, I was called to be faithful. And the reason I bring that up is because we can talk endlessly about all the shortcomings uh, of your tradition, my tradition, our traditions, uh, and we gotta get to work. Well, the, the likelihood is that we're not gonna succeed, but that's not the point. The point is to be a voice that cares and articulates that caring. One of the biggest challenges that faces a religious person or a person who is faith-based in their value set is how do you walk the tight rope of aspiring towards, because you never really reach it, but aspiring towards righteousness, justice, goodness, without falling over into the abyss of self-righteousness? I think this past election um, taught us the the evilness of self-righteousness that actually led us to Donald Trump being the president of the United States, the people who were so self-involved in their own individual politics and their own personal opinions about social issues and political issues that it, they couldn't even bring themselves to go to the polls or they couldn't even, or if they did go to the polls, they went the wrong way um, because they were just so self-righteous in their politics. And I think that for me, and, I'll, and I, I think that it, it, people will say maybe there just isn't room for faith in politics, and I actually think, in fact, that is where we need faith the most. I think that we need to understand what can drive some people to vote for um, Donald Trump. I do think that there was a great deal of coded racism there, and I think that some of their supporters even have said, said as much. He, he says what I would want to say. He says what I'm thinking out loud. So I don't know if that's judgmental. I think that's being descriptive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just being honest. Mm -hmm. Now, I, but go, but I think to back up a little bit in terms of what we're saying, I think part of the problem is we've gotten to the point in this country where we look at faith as if faith were a series of propositions like a political platform. Mm -hmm. And so this is your faith, this is my faith, where I think we really need to back up and talk about what do we mean by faith? You asked about self-righteousness, and uh, self-righteously I'll proclaim that I'm not guilty, right? Uh, but I think there's guilt to be shared, and including my own. Uh, but I'm very much uh, keeping in mind for the moment, uh, I think it was Emerson, God never made anything that didn't have a crack in it. Uh, and then Leonard Cohn came along and said, that's okay, that's how the light gets in. I'd love to modify it to that's how the light can get out. Because I, I, I need the other in order to be. So how in the world can I decide to use you as a thing if I'm therefore diminishing myself in that activity? I mean, it clearly reducing our option, opportunity to meet the sacred. I, mean, I also think there's another issue that, that's at hand too, and it's the whole fluidity of what is truth. And when people voted, I mean, Trump did tell the truth. He said he was a xenophobe. He said he was going to build a wall. He said he was going to kick out certain populations. And people just thought he didn't mean me. He didn't mean my family. Um, he didn't mean my people. He meant somebody else. And that's when he told the truth. Now, what was the problem? In part, it was the, I didn't believe it was about me. But the other part is, people said, well, in political campaigns, everybody lies. Well, the one time the guy tells the truth, you think he's lying. <laughs> and then when he's lying, you know, because he's worried about crowd size, you know, everybody's going after that. But the problem is, why did we vote for people who lie? 
And where is the conversation about a political system that has built itself on, well, we all know this process is going to be built in lies. Why is that conversation not changing? In the closing remarks, I want you to reflect on how can we contribute to overcoming the failures that we have talked about in this environment of divisiveness and polarization without being part of the problem, being part of the solution, but not being part of the problem. So Linda, I'll begin with you. So I think, um, I think for me, when I think about this current moment that we are in, um, if you are a person of faith or we are come from faith communities or faith traditions, if our faith traditions are not contributing to social justice, if we are not at the forefront, if we are not moving our congregations, if we are not moving the members of our communities to stand up for immigrants, for undocumented people, for LGBTQ communities, if we're not asking people to stand up against Islamophobia or asking folks to stand up against anti-Semitism, then what in fact is our faith traditions and why are we even here or why are we even invoking them? I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington DC a few years ago and I went again because I wanted to remember if, if I remember correctly what I saw when I went there. And there's a sign in the Holocaust Museum in Washington DC that says early warning signs of fascism. And it says things like disdain for human rights, disdain for the arts and intellectuals. It says, you know, rampant sexism, cronyism and corruption, obsession with crime and punishment, obsession with national security. Uh, basically everything that I, is on that list is something that is already somehow happening in some way. So what I wanna also put forth here for people to think about is like, we are not just in any other moment. This is not George W. Bush. We're not under Ronald Reagan. Like this is fascism. And we need all hands on deck and in particular, organized congregations, people who have access to large numbers of people to figure out what are we gonna do to translate our faith traditions into actual resistance. Like where is the resistance that every single one of us comes from a faith tradition where we resisted oppression, where we resistance against tyrants. And this is the moment for us to find those elements of our faith and bring them to the forefront because we need it now more than ever. I, I say this with respect because there's nothing that Linda said that I disagree with. But if we're going to make progress, we've got to find room for those with whom we disagree. And so I don't think it's just the street. And I don't, even as we need to be in the street. But you, you, you said righteous indignation. And, and my, my fear is that that cuts us off from the other. I mean, for instance, I mean, I'm stunned still that I live in a country in which uh, so many millions of people with whom I do not share a universe of values. It's incredible to me. Now, I can stay there or I can say, what are the values that will open some doors between us so that I can at least comprehend? One of the great privileges of my life is I, I, I spent time with Nelson Mandela. And I, 27 plus years of his life stolen. And, and if you've, you know him or if you've met him, not a, a scintilla of anger in him whatsoever. How? I would be pissed off. <laughs> and I asked him, he said, if I spend it in anger, I will become a person I hope that I would no longer wish to be. But if I spend it in making a difference, but Maybe didn't the prophets, I mean, the prophets that are celebrated in our faiths, all of our faiths, didn't they have a little bit of both? I mean, didn't they have righteous indignation at moments in time and show total forgiveness and love and tolerance at other times? So is it one or the other? And how do you, how do, you do what Rabbi Michael talked about, which is to reach out to those who don't share even your universal set of values and try to sway them in a positive direction? St. Thomas Aquinas taught that one can sin against anger in three ways. One can sin against anger by um, excess, and when your anger becomes wrath. He says you can sin against anger by, in, by uh, the wrong object. It's a misdirected object. You're angry at the wrong thing. The classic case being that you're angry at your significant other and you take it out on someone else. But he also says that you can sin by anger by deficiency. When you're not angry when you ought to be angry because anger is the passion that moves the will to justice. So 
so yes, it's a, it's a matter of, yes, we don't want to be so wrathful that we cannot be open to the one who, who we have an honest disagreement with, but we cannot let our eagerness to be in uh, an understanding relationship with that one to blind us to the real injustices that are present that are crying out for response. Pope Francis, two simple words that he said to young people that are far from simple. And in Spanish is, hagan leo, make a mess. Mm -hmm. We're in a time that needs a mess because we're in a mess. Number two, we have the delusional thought that this is the first time in the human history that there is um, a pluricultural, um, plurireligious society. Final word is in Washington, D.C., um, in the Hirschhorn Gallery on the outside in the garden, there's a statue called El Profeta, and it's by the Spanish artist Gargallo, who was, did it in the 1930s, the time of the rise of fascism, not only in Europe, but in Spain. It, you can see the ribs and the finger is up in the air of indignation and righteousness and anger. And it looks like the wind is going to blow him away, and surely a Chicago wind would. But the most fascinating part about this statue is not any of the stuff that we associate traditionally with prophets. But if you look, the feet are disproportionate to the rest of the body. The feet are enormous. And in that, when you look at that, what it says is that prophets are rooted in the communities of accountability that we accompany. So we too are parts of these communities. All of us are in this performance together and it's a performance that must be transformative of the mess. We thank everybody who's tuning in and watching. Have a great night. Thank you very much. We're glad you've been with us for this special edition of Sanctuary on presidential politics and keeping faith. Your thoughts and reactions to issues and ideas at the intersection of life and faith are important to us, and we want to hear from you. Email us at gcbm at ameritech.net, visit our website at gcbm.org, and write to us at Sanctuary in care of the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries, 77 West Washington Street, Chicago, 60602. That's Sanctuary, the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries, 77 West Washington Street, Chicago, 60602. I'm Lydia Talbot. Thanks for keeping faith with us today on Sanctuary. May peace be with you. Thank you.